What is going on, everyone? Today is the 21st of September, 2017. My name is Danny, and I just want to welcome you all to today's training, where we are going to discuss a really, really important topic, and that is fat. And not in the sense of your body composition this week, that was last week, but more so your dietary fats and the nutrition needs for your body. So I've had a couple of questions raised about dietary fats from my clients, and I truly appreciate those. And so I'm excited to go over those. And so we're going to cover those, sit back, relax, enjoy your car ride or your cardio session or your workout session while listening to this audio training and uh, take some mental notes or uh, real notes if you're not doing a task that requires your hands. So go get out a pen and paper if you have a moment. But other than that, here we go. So a couple of questions that I would like to put out here now so I can assure you that they will be answered to the best of my ability um, is what, are, what is your take on good fats versus bad fats? Um, nuts are really high in fat, but most diet-minded folks consider them good fats and the same with avocado. Should I feel less bad going over my fats if they're quote unquote good fats? And then the second question is what's the magic in the amount of fats to target. Some days I really struggle to stay within my macros, others I end up eight to 10 grams below. So what do fats do for me? Do they provide fuel? What is their purpose? So we will, we will touch on all of those things and hopefully this, the way that they're answered actually answers your question. Um, I've got about five pages of notes that I wanna cover, so I'm excited to go through this, but definitely let me know if this raises other questions, other comments, other concerns. Um, and I'll do my best to answer those in a future um, audio training or video. So let me briefly bring you all back to our hierarchy of nutrition and hierarchy of fat loss. No, I'm not going to spend 10 minutes on it because we have previously covered this in depth in several videos. But the most important thing when it comes to fat loss and muscle gain is your focus on nutrition. And the most important thing to focus on when it comes to your nutrition is your calorie intake, and your balance of energy, closely followed by your macronutrients and your fiber intake. This being said, there are lots of intricacies that we deal with when it comes to what fats we should consume, how much of them we should consume, and why we should consume them. So every person is different, which is why all of you have different body types, different goals, and different macronutrient budgets. I prefer to coach and train with a science-based approach meaning I, I do my best to work with the most up-to-date research information that I have hand in hand with what I have seen work for me and for you each individually. So experience. While there is a lot of like baseline information out there that works kind of for the average person in lots of different experiments and like research experiments, um, we're kind of an experiment each of us ourselves. So we have to experiment a little bit individually, which is why it's so important for you to accurately track your meals and your food intake day to day. If we don't have accurate data to work with, then we don't know what works well and what doesn't work well for you. So my take on fats is actually very similar in a sense to my take on protein and carbohydrates. And I mean this in that overall, it's important to hit your macronutrient budget goals for the day. But if you have options on the different sources of foods that you intake to meet your macronutrient budget daily, then choosing whole, natural, non-processed, or minimally processed nutrient-dense foods are going to be your best options. Looking at fat then, what types of fats are considered whole, natural, non-processed, or minimally processed and or nutrient-dense? My opinion and thoughts here may differ from others just depending on their goals and their lifestyles and amount of reading that they do and whether that reading is science-based reading or tabloid reading or magazine and news-based reading. I think you get where I'm going here. Um, a lot of the information that I'm providing here, again, it's based on my experience and what I have learned from my previous coaches as well as... Um, I think his name is Tom Venuti, Venuto. Uh, he wrote a book called Burn the Fat, Feed the Muscle. It's phenomenal. It has a ton of awesome information in there and it is really written so that anyone, even without a science background, can understand it. And then, of course, 
I am an ACE certified personal trainer as well as sports nutrition specialist. So a lot of the information I have and the knowledge I have is from my courses through the American Council on Exercise. Um, but everybody has a different way of learning and a different time period that they learn things in. So you just got to take everything with a grain of salt and I think really find what works best for you. So I guess the question is, is there a magic amount of fats to target? Yes and no. There is an ideal amount of fat intake for you. There is also an amount of fat that is too low and could cause many different types of health problems like skin and hair problems, joint pain, fatigue, depression, cardiovascular disease, and reduced metabolism. A non-fat diet, which is also kind of fattish if you ask me, um, it's a considered an amount of fat that is less than 10% of your daily calories. For example, if you have a 1600 calorie per day budget, that would be 17 grams of fat per day. Generally speaking, a healthy amount of fat to have in your diet for someone not on a ketogenic diet is somewhere between 20 and 35% of your total daily calories. So for someone, again, on a 1600 calorie per day diet, 20% would be 35.5 grams of fat per day, and 35% on the high end would be 62 grams of fat per day. So uh, the, the majority of my clients actually I find that they eat a healthy amount of fat on an average week, meaning a normal lifestyle, no additional stressors or external factors affecting the week. But I do find that this is also because they eat too few fats on some days and then overload on fats other days. So it's, it averages out nicely, but it's not necessarily the greatest balance day to day. Um, and again, I'll see that even more like, when when they are stressed out because a lot of people when they're stressed they either don't eat or they stress eat so you'll find that usually when you go to stress eat or you're not thinking about something you automatically will grab something that is processed high in fat and high in carbs um one extreme or the other so a goal of mine for each client is to just bring you all into a consistent intake so that we can properly identify where we need to adjust and what the right intake is for you now, on the days many of you have an intake that is lower than the bottom end of your range, I want you to go ahead and take a look at where your carbs are. My guess is that they're probably over the high end of your carb range. Uh, you can eat a lot more grams of carbs versus grams of fat because they are much less calorically dense. For example, you have an item of food that is 10 grams of carbs. Multiply that by four because one gram of carbs is equal to four calories and you get 40 calories. If you have an item of food that is 10 grams of fat, you would multiply 10 by nine because one gram of fat is equal to nine calories and you get 90 calories. So you can see there's a big difference there in caloric amount. Fats and fiber slow your digestion, which helps control blood sugar and insulin more effectively. Sugar and starchy carbs digest more quickly, therefore you can eat more of it in the same amount of time. So let's quickly touch on a high fat diet like a ketogenic diet. A ketogenic diet is approximately 70% of your total calories that come from fat, about 25% of them from protein, and 5% carbs. Your body's main preferred fuel source comes from carbohydrates, um, but for medical or preferential reasons, some people choose or need to eliminate carbohydrates from their nutrition intake, and when there are no carbohydrates to convert into muscle glycogen for fuel, your body switches over to using fat as fuel and turning fat into what's called ketones. Now, adding ketone supplements to your nutrition without eliminating the carbohydrates and adding in proper training consistently along with your nutrition habits will not work. Though it seems to be a fad as of the moment, don't fall for it. There's lots of ketone supplements out there and simply by adding in a ketone supplement, it's not going to help you reach those goals. It's just not. Um, so there's no evidence to show that a high fat, low carb diet is better for you for fat loss and muscle gain compared to a balanced diet or a high protein, low fat diet. Yes, it does work. That's not to say that it doesn't work. It is just no better or worse than another type of diet. Um, and Martha is actually a perfect example here. She's, I think, lost since she came back from Panama and got really, really strict on her ketogenic diet, she's lost like 10 or 11 pounds, which is just awesome. Um, but 
you have to consider if that is going to work for you. Can it be sustainable for you? You need to be very clear with yourself when you embark on a restrictive nutrition plan. I know for me personally, I'm not willing to give up pizza and ice cream or a multitude of other carbohydrates. I've had success with higher carb, higher protein, moderate fat diets. And until that doesn't work, or until I'm told by a medical professional that I need to alter my eating habits, um, I'm not going to change anything. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know? So I just, I, the struggle is when you're not consistent and you're not making progress. So it's like, if we see that the consistency of whatever ratio you may be on is working for you in the fat loss and muscle gain department, then there's no need to change it. If you are consistent and it's not getting you to your goals, then we know we need to change something. So again, if you're not being consistent and you're not making progress, that's when I'm kind of at a loss and I don't know how to change things because I don't know what's staying consistent. I can tell you all the things that aren't consistent, but until we stay consistent with things, then I don't know what doesn't work. So I don't have, I don't know what factors to change. Hopefully that makes sense, but that's just some food for thought. So really quick before we get into the different categories of fat, take a moment to either write down or think about or comment below if you're either watching or listening to this replay in the Facebook group or on YouTube with something in this audio experience that has been uh, helpful for you so far. Like what have you learned or what have you heard today that has suddenly kind of made something just click for you? So take a moment and either pause this video and do that or um, just kind of write it down as you go, right? Take notes as, as we're going through this. This is a lot of good information. Even going through this for me, this is a good recap for me. So different categories of fat. So there's two different major categories of fat. We've got saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Um, this is not a good versus bad fats, FYI, <laughs> just different types of fats. So let's start with the definition of saturated fats first. So saturated fats are primarily animal fats like butter, cheese, dairy fat, chocolate, egg yolks, meat fat, shortening, palm oil, milk fat, and coconut oil. In the past, you've probably heard that saturated fats are referred to as bad fats, so let's just kind of clarify that. Within fats, we have fatty acids, and there are essential and non-essential fatty acids. The type of fatty acids that come in saturated fats is non-essential, meaning we produce non-essential fatty acids in our bodies and don't need to intake them through our nutrition, though it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just extra. Um, egg yolks actually have nutrients in them that protect you from macular degeneration, and they reduce levels of hunger, your hunger hormone, which is called ghrelin. So there are like different benefits to saturated foods, but maybe limiting them is a good idea. So that's not saying cut them out, that's saying limit. They're just not quite as beneficial for you as other types of fats. Butter, for example, provides a lot of calories very quickly and does not have essential fatty acids. So if, if it's the end of your day and you need to add something to your meal because you're about 15 grams shy of your fat goals, well, then cooking your chicken or your steak or your vegetables or pasta with a tablespoon of butter or oil is okay. Is it the best option? I don't know. This is where you have to take a look at your total day if you are that concerned about it and see if you've had any unsaturated fats. If you take a look at everything and all you've had is saturated fats throughout the day, then maybe you wanna look at having an avocado or nuts or seeds instead. Um, and an avocado, you can get it in avocado oil. You can get some different nut oils. So, you know, that's, that's totally possible. You can trade out butter for, um, for like, yeah, for a, a nut oil. Um, let's see what else. Coconut oil is also a saturated fat that is, again, somewhat in a current fad being promoted as a health product. And yes, it does have healthy qualities. And the fact that you can cook with it at a high temperature because it has a much higher smoke point than other oils is a good bonus, but it does not have essential fatty acids in it. So again, be careful about taking it in more than your daily allotment of fat calories. 
um, by using oils, you can easily and quickly go over your fat calories. As I mentioned before, every day is not ideal, and it is more important that you hit your calorie and your macronutrient goals than stress about the type of fat that you're taking in. And yes, your particular genetics, your health status, your lifestyle, uh, the quantity of saturated fats and overall diet may require you to avoid a specific type of saturated fat. For example, if you are lactose intolerant, then you should probably avoid the dairy items that contain saturated fat. However, if your doctor or registered dietitian has not given you a restriction, then you shouldn't fear saturated fats. Okay, so now on to unsaturated fats, which are also divided into polyunsaturated and monounsaturated. They are mainly derived from plant and vegetable sources as opposed to animal sources, and they tend to lower levels of blood cholesterol and have other health benefits along with containing the, those essential fatty acids that our body does not create on its own. Um, because our body doesn't create them on its own, it's essential to get them from different nutrient sources. So what is so important then about the essential fatty acids that we must get into our diets? Well, the two essential fatty acids that are so important are omega-3s and omega-6s. So when you're in GNC or the supplement aisle at Whole Foods and you see the supplements that say like fish oil or krill oil or omega-3s or omega-369, these are those essential fatty acid supplements. And for those of you who are curious about the benefits of essential fatty acids within the unsaturated fats, which should hopefully be anyone still listening to this audio at this point, here's a short list of those things. So they will improve insulin sensitivity, required for absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, they're essential for joint health, they're required for energy production, they're required for oxygen transfer, they help maintain cell membrane integrity. They help suppress cortisol production, so it's related to stress. Um, they help improve skin texture. They help promote muscle growth. They help increase metabolic rate, and they help you burn fat. Now, please don't listen to this list and think that you need to go eat a ton of unsaturated fats. That's not how this works, um, and there is an optimal amount optimal keyword here, optimal amount of essential fatty acids that will provide the above items, but too much or not enough will either have you gaining weight or have you become deficient in different nutrients. So an optimal amount would be, um, you can probably get that through about one serving size of a rich source of omega-3 essential fatty acids. So sources like salmon, sardines, herring, mackerel, rainbow trout, albacore tuna, flax seeds, walnuts, fish oil, krill oil, flaxseed oil. This list is not all inclusive, by the way. It's just examples. Um, and if you know me, you must be asking, well, Danny, how on earth do you get that? Because you don't like any of those things. You're right. I don't like seafood. I don't like fish. I'm not a huge nut fan. So how do I get in my essential fatty acids? Well, I take a supplement because I don't like fish or seafood and I'm not a huge fan of nuts. Um, and that, that seems to work well for me. I have not had any issues. Um, if you are going to take a supplement or you like me, just don't like any of those other options, again, not an all-inclusive list, then I encourage you to consult with your doctor um, or your registered dietitian. But research has shown that one to three grams per day and usually this is the serving size on most bottles, is an optimal amount for a supplement. Now, if you're gonna use something like flaxseed oil, then one tablespoon is about a typical dose. And I would not cook with flaxseed oil. It has a very low smoke point, meaning that if you heat it too high, it can become rancid. Uh, same goes for like olive oil, but it is fine to pour on top of a salad or put in protein shakes, something like that. Um, also keep in mind that supplements have calories and fish oil or flaxseed oil or coconut oil or omega-3s, they all have fat in them. So you should absolutely track these in my fitness pal or your tracker of choice. And I did not know that until uh, the beginning of my second season bodybuilding. And so I realized I was um, going over on my fat macros every day for a while by a couple of grams. Um, 
which was not good, but you know what? I learned from it and now I track it. So um, how should you in an ideal world on an ideal day where everything is planned out, divide up the different types of fats in your day? So ideally, it is recommended for us to limit saturated fats to about 10% of our total daily calories. So if you're eating 30% of your calories from fats, then one third of them can come from saturated fats. It is then recommended that you divide up your remaining fat calories between monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. Now don't fret over this. Focus again on getting quality whole foods in the majority of the time and keeping variety in your days and you'll be just fine. Oh, that rhymed. Do y'all you catch that? I'm gonna be like the next Dr. Seuss. Okay, <laughs> this is where tracking comes in handy because if you start to feel like something's off, then you can go back through your food diary and see what you have been eating and then pinpoint what you might be missing. All right, again, I'm going to pause here and ask you to pause the video and think about what you've learned so far and what part of this audio training has been most valuable. I mean, what information can you take and implement into your daily life? And, and please let me know. Like, I really appreciate your feedback because it helps me to grow as a coach, helps me to better understand y'all as my peers and as, as clients. Um, you may not have had these questions at the beginning of the training, but maybe some of this information has sparked new questions. So let me know if this is, you know, brought new questions to light for you or answered any questions or what information has kind of been brought to light for you. Okay, back to it. I mentioned above that many fats and oils are calorie dense. So let me shed some light on this through like some examples and numbers. So one tablespoon of butter or oil is usually around 100 to 130 calories and 11 to 14 grams of fat. So that might be one third of your daily fat goals, right? On days that you find you've eaten higher in fats throughout the day and you need to save on some calories, I recommend that you use some sort of cooking spray. And those can come in like avocado oil spray, coconut spray, olive oil spray, canola oil spray, so on and so forth. There's lots of options. Um, you would have to spray these cans for about 15 straight seconds to have the same amount as one tablespoon of oil poured out of a bottle. So it's definitely a calorie saver. It's not calorie free, though it says calorie free. A serving size is just um, less than what they would actually have to put for any calories to be present. Um, and then let's see, nuts. Nuts are also, they're really great source of monounsaturated fats. And many people associate nuts with being a, you know, a good healthy source of protein or fat. Um, and they are, but companies don't advertise that nuts are a higher source of fat than they are of protein, which leads people to think that they should be taking handfuls of nuts as a good healthy snack, not realizing how small a portion size actually is. And they end up probably eating, you know, about four times as many fat calories as protein calories, and thus very quickly eating a small physical amount of food that puts them way over on their calorie goals. So it's, it's interesting that a common reason for fat loss plateaus is from eating too much quote unquote healthy food and healthy fats. So uh, you want enough of these fats in your daily nutrition to get the optimal nutrition from them, but without extra calories that you don't need. So the last big point I want to touch on today is the quote unquote bad fats. And what are they and what should we avoid? And real quick, I'm gonna get a sip of water. So y'all should do the same. Okay, so I mentioned you can find whole nutrient dense foods within all of the macronutrient categories. And you can also find highly processed foods that manufacturers have created to enhance the shelf life of foods. And you can do that in all macronutrient categories. So can you see where I'm going with this? Uh, the words we are looking for here as far as what to avoid on nutrition labels or packaging are hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated, and trans fatty acids. So to keep this short, we find that these three words associated with hydrogenated oils, margarines, spreads, 
baked goods and fried goods. So I'm going to create a document for my coaching clients listening to this that has a list of different types of saturated, unsaturated, poly and mono, and then these, you know, bad fats so that it's kind of a quick cheat sheet for you. So be on the lookout for that. And this is not to say uh, that you should never have these things, but you should have them in moderation. I'm talking about these, you know, quote unquote, bad, bad fats. Um, some trans fatty acids are found in meat and dairy products, but since they are naturally occurring in those products, you don't need to fret about them. What we are worried about here are the highly processed foods. So even when a nutrition label says no trans fats, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but the food companies are still allowed to put trans fats in the food as long as it does not exceed 0.5 grams per serving. Um, so what is in the ingredient list? may not match what's on the nutrition facts. So when you look at a nutrition flat facts label, you'll see that rectangle that has your macronutrients, your micronutrients in it, and then there will be an ingredient list. When you read through an ingredient list, it usually goes, well, it, it always goes from the most abundant item to the least. So the first item that you read, there's gonna be the most of that item or most of the product is going to be made up of that item and so on and so forth. So if you see those three words in the ingredient list, but you don't see it listed on the macro, under the macronutrients on the nutrition label, you know, just know that there are some trans fats in there. It's just something to be aware of. Um, so what, what other foods contain these trans fats and hydrogenated oils? Well, before I list them off, see if you can think of any. Write them down. So here we go. It's going to be different types of fried foods, whether that be, you know, onion rings or fried cheesecake or I don't know, any type of fried food, fried wings, uh, cookies, crackers, biscuits, pies, pastries, frostings, donuts, corn chips, taco shells, shortening, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, refined vegetable oils, packaged baked goods like croutons, crackers, breads, etc., and margarine. Again, the list is not all inclusive. Um, but anything that is like highly processed really is, and then, you know, it's the same that goes for, for protein and for carbs. Like protein bars are great, but you know what? They're highly processed. So of course, if you can get, you know, whole range chicken or, you know, grass fed beef instead of a protein bar, that's going to give you a lot a lot better of an output than than the protein bar but if you're in a pinch you know what the protein bar is going to be just fine you're still going to get energy from it you're still going to get carbs you're still going to get fats you're still going to get protein but it's a processed item you know so you just want to limit those same goes for carbs like well and a lot of protein bars are high carb too but you you don't want to always eat processed carbohydrate foods. So just natural whole foods, if you can get them, is the best way to go. But it's not to say that I don't have a donut every now and then. It's not to say that I don't have real ice cream every now and then or pizza. Like it's just part of it's part of the maintain maintenance of a long term sustainable lifestyle. Every now and then you gotta have those those feel good home cooked foods or home baked foods, I guess I should say the good stuff, you know, the stuff that's usually higher carb, higher fat, lower protein. Uh, we all know what those things are. So what are the reasons that we should limit these items in our daily nutrition intake? So here's kind of a listing of the, of those reasons. So they can, and we're talking about the trans fats, trans fatty acids here. Um, it can raise LDL bad cholesterol. It can lower HDL, which is the good cholesterol, they can increase blood triglycerides, decrease insulin sensitivity, increase insulin response to glucose, they can hamper your immune system function, they can interfere with your liver's detoxification process, they do have cancer-causing agents, they can increase your risk of type 2 diabetes, they can cause inflammation in the body. They can interfere with essential fatty acid functions. And they can make your platelets stickier. 
Okay, don't freak out. This should not cause you to never have a piece of cake or a donut ever again. This is just to say, if you ate nothing but these types of processed foods instead of a homemade or natural nutrient-dense food, then you're at a higher risk for those above things. High intake of trans fats is correlated to those destructive effects. They are not necessarily a direct cause by themselves. You have to consider and remember that there are a lot of other factors that you can take into account here, like age, your daily activity level, your overall lifestyle, your carbohydrates, your protein, your fiber intake, the list goes on. So just, just keep that in mind, okay? Let's see. All right, that pretty much covers everything. So I just wanna thank you guys for listening today and I'm gonna quickly um, recap some of the highlights from today's training and let you be on your way. Um, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube and you found this information valuable, then please subscribe to my channel or be my friend on Facebook. Um, give the video a thumbs up, so click the little icon that looks like a thumbs up. Um, share it with your friends so that this information can be reached by more people who have an interest in taking their nutrition into their own hands. Um, so I just, I really appreciate you guys. Um, and I just want to be able to reach as many people as possible with this information. So if you liked it, make sure you share it with somebody else so that they can like it as well. Okay, so for the recap, let's see. Aim for 20 to 35% of your total calories um, to be from fat. Eat fatty fish two to three times per week or talk to your doctor or registered dietitian about fish oil, or an omega-3 supplement. Eat nuts and seeds, but stay within your fat calorie limits. Also eat avocados and olives, but again, stay within your fat calorie limit. And that goes for, for any of those higher, um, higher calorie fat items. Let's see, limit trans fats, including foods with hydrogenated on the label, as well as limit deep fried foods. Um, and then we discuss the different types of fats you have available to you. So saturated and unsaturated and what they can do for your body. Why it is good to have an optimal amount. So not too much, not too little. And then the thoughts on good fats versus bad fats. Um, that really, that kind of sums it all up, you guys. So I certainly hope this was valuable to you all. And if you are a client of mine, please post in the Facebook group how this was valuable to you and what you learned today. Again, I kind of find that even I learn new things as a reminder myself of all this information and it kind of sticks a little bit better each time. So uh, I'm happy to have gone back through this for my own nutrition health. <laughs> um, yeah, that being said, I'm actually going to stay more consistent with my omega-3 supplement and I'm going to go have one with my dinner right now. So um, you'll have an amazing morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what time of day you listen to this. And I will talk to you in the next training session. Again, my name is Danny. Thank you guys so much and have a wonderful evening. I will talk to y'all later. Bye.